Well, hello, and thank you for joining me for another Alex on Tech and ITY TV interview. Today, I'm joined by Rachel Greaves, the CEO and co-founder of the award-winning Australian data management company, Castle Point Systems. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. So, Rachel, let's start at the beginning. Can you please tell us what Castle Point Systems offers to the market today? Mm, sure. So, we're kind of a new way of managing information. It's like a new paradigm. Um, and what Castle Point essentially does is it tells you what you have and where it is in terms of all of your data and who's doing what to it, which is key, it's important. Um, but then we go a bit further to help work out what of that data has risk and what has value. And then finally, to understand what regulatory rules apply to that data and whether they're being met. So what was the spark that encouraged you and co-founder Gavin McKay? to create Castle Point Systems and what is both of your backgrounds in this area? You know, what got you excited to build a business around modern data management? Yeah, so I'm a certified auditor mm -hmm. um, and reckless manager and security manager and privacy engineer, so I'm really a compliance person. That's been my career. Um, Gav's a technologist. He's been doing it for 30 years. And in 2012, we started a consulting company together. Um, we were auditing information records, security governance failures, I guess, uh, at federal government agencies and large organisations. And what we sort of found consistently was that um, not only were projects and initiatives to manage information for its life cycle not succeeding, they actually couldn't have succeeded. There just wasn't actually technology that could achieve what needed to be achieved at this kind of scale and with these kind of challenges, so we knew we had to design something ourselves. Yeah, I mean, most people would be familiar with something like Microsoft SharePoint as an EDRMS or Electronic Document and Records Management System. So, mm -hmm. you know, how is Castle Point system different and better? I mean, you know, with, you'd imagine that in the modern world, with all of our technology, that uh, records and databases was something that was sorted out eons ago, but clearly not. Yeah, so I mean, back in the day, we had just maybe a few sort of core central systems. So you had an EDRMS, you had a mail server, you had a CRM, you probably had file shares, and most information was consolidated in there. But that's just not the case anymore. Now, you know, we have like dozens, hundreds. Defence has two and a half thousand approved systems on the approved software list, so we can have thousands of places that information is being held, and all of that information could be evidence of business. Like it could all have continuing value, it could all have risk. Mm -hmm. So for a long time, and this is why these control projects kept failing, um, we've been trying to shoehorn that sort of proliferated, distributed data back into the traditional model to mm -hmm. say put it into a central EDRMS. We still see the ANAO writing audit report saying, you know, organisation, you need to do better, you have to put all your data into the EDRMS. Mm. But it just isn't possible. You can't put all your structured data from databases into an unstructured EDRMS system. You can't take information out of its context and the business processes that generate it um, and put it somewhere central where people can't find it. So not only is it a, a productivity issue when we do that, but we actually saw, and this was kind of inspiring and motivating to us, we saw some really catastrophic outcomes of that being done. So, um, I mean, you might remember Vivian Salon. She was an Australian citizen, really vulnerable woman with a mental illness. She was found with a head injury in a park in Lismore, and she was then deported by the Department of I Immigration. Remember. That was some years ago. You remember, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So she got deported. She got sent to the Philippines, left in a home for the dying and destitute. She left her kid at daycare, never picked him up. Mm -hmm. He was put in the foster system. And the whole reason she was sent was because that department, Dimir at the time, couldn't find her record in their central Even EDRMS. she was an Australian citizen. Her record was there the whole time. Yeah, yeah. It just was hard to find. Mm. And that's not a one-off, like the same thing happened with Cornelia Rao, another that's, Australian that's citizen. The name, you that's remember her? The one, yeah, that's the one I remember. You might have watched Stateless, the ABC series about her. Mm. So locked in immigration detention because they couldn't relate her record between the EDRMS and the line of business system. So this model of traditional EDRMS where we're trying to make people take their stuff out of its context where they're collaborating, where they're running process and managing, and duplicate it or move it or copy it into a central EDRMS, that's a broken model. We have to manage in place. People are going to use systems. They're going to create data all the time, and all of it needs to be managed no matter where it is. I mean, one of the things we talk about, or at the industry talks about with digital transformation, is this whole idea of all these silos of information that need to be broken down and the whole system needs to be redone and uh, modernised. And it mm. sounds as though that the EDRMS needs just as much digital transformation 
as <laughs> the rest of all the IT that we use. So I, I've read obviously a bit about Castle Point before coming to this interview, and you talk about a data castle approach. Mm. So how is this the answer? How is it a superior way to manage, search, and secure all of an organization's data? Right. So we came up with the data castle after really thoroughly interrogating the other potential approaches and understanding really why they couldn't work. So that first approach is to centralise the data. It doesn't work, it hasn't worked, it won't work. It's not appropriate. So the second approach is to integrate systems together. Let's, like, let's connect SharePoint to our central EDRMS. That introduces so much cascading technology risk. When we tightly couple systems together like that, you can't upgrade one without upgrading the other. They end up having supportability and sustainability issues. Um, it's not an appropriate model when we have so many systems and new ones all the time coming in. We can't have agents and connectors and try to couple these systems together. So Just integration. Too much of a... Not it's an absolute snarl, yeah. yeah. So that's not appropriate either. So we don't want to centralise, we don't want to scale. integrate. That can't scale. It doesn't scale. Um, so we had to come up with some different ways. Um, there have been other attempts at working out how we can manage in place. So how do we let people use email, SharePoint, file shares, but still records manage them. But all those approaches were heavily rules based. Like it's, it's like a mechanical Turk, like it looks like a machine is doing it, it looks like automation or AI, but really there's someone in there pedalling all day long, writing a rule, like a new rule for every single file share, a new rule for every single library, also not scalable or sustainable. So none of those could work, so we had to come up with something new. And the data castle is actually like an ancient concept, right? But it's now possible with modern AI. So you imagine a, like a castle <laughs> uh, at the top of a hill. And from the castle, you have a command and control position across all the people and the data and the processes in that kingdom, so like the inside the network. Surveying the battlefield. Correct. So in perspective. Totally. So from the top, you can actually see what's happening with all those people and all the data and all their processes, but you never bring those people or their data or their processes inside the castle walls. You know, the people in the castle are your kings and queens of compliance. But from the castle, you're managing the whole network, like the whole kingdom. As long as you're inside the walls of the network, you're being managed from the castle. So um, we use AI to do that. It's now possible, and that's sort of the new paradigm. Well, today we see the increasing growth in cyber attacks. It's just going crazy. COVID has allowed so much chaos and confusion. And, mm. uh, you know, the risk exposure that organisations face from not having control around their data is massive. So can you tell us more about the regulatory need for the highest levels of security, given the records retention and handling and requirements under various acts and regulations? Yeah, this is a, this is a tricky one because people often don't, they don't connect security and records management. They see them as two separate disciplines. And in fact, they often have kind of a polar opposite drive. So your records managers are focused on like, how long can we keep stuff, you know, let's keep all the important stuff forever. Whereas cyber is more worried about like, what can we get rid of? What can we shed from the environment? So they do kind of conflict and contradict. But if you don't manage both, then you end up with, again, really serious bad outcomes. Like if you look at um, ANU, the Australian National University, so their model was to um, just have records, official records in the EDRMS and everything else in all the other hundreds of systems, not a record and not managed for the records life cycle. And then of course in October 2018, a foreign state government penetrates that network, exfiltrates 19 years worth of student records, everything. including mine, yeah. everything gone. Yeah. So that government has my tax file number now. Um, and it shouldn't have been that big. Like that breach shouldn't have been that big because my record should have been disposed of after seven years and I graduated like 15 years ago. So if we don't, if we don't manage the regulatory obligations in terms of life cycle of data, what we need to keep, what the minimum retention is and when we can get rid of stuff, we end up allowing the threat surface to grow and grow and grow continually. It's almost inevitable that there will be a breach. There's so much focus on interconnectedness of data, sharing, accessibility. We've got a distributed workforce now, as you mentioned, people working from home, very hard to govern and control what they're doing and the devices they're doing it on and the networks they're running the data across. It's hard. So, you know, we still need to focus on reducing the likelihood of breaches where we can, but we really have to laser in on reducing the impact of breaches. They always talk about this idea of um, 
uh, well, both zero trust, but also limiting access to information. So yes. if, if somebody comes, it's like permission control. So if someone gets your username and password, they might be able to get in, but they'll only have limited access on purpose. Because yep. only like a super administrator, of which should be very rare, would have access to everything. Everyone else only gets access to their information and that's it. And so the data obviously has to be treated the same way. It, it also reminds me about how, you know, IT used to just be oh, the IT department, but now it's the entire business. And mm. clearly, this data records, it's the entire business because every, everything a business does is generating data of some sort. Yep. You, Google and uh, modern technology, machine learning and AI gives us the ability to data mine this in ways that were unthinkable um, even 10 or 20 years ago. Mm. Certainly 50 years ago when they made that famous statement that says, advertising 50% of it is wasted I just don't know which 50% and uh, of course now today we know with extreme certainty you know where all that money is going so you know even the federal government is looking at all of this with its own data strategy and that's due to arrive in the very near mm. future so what's your view on you know the whole of government transformation that's going to take all this data and manage it mm -hmm. it's great um it's that should be speaking at <laughs> <point>, right <laughs> look they Yes, because um, what the strategy doesn't do and what no strategies have done so far, either in the departments like NAA or DTA or, you know, the whole of government ones mm -hmm. here or overseas, is to really map the, the trade-off and the balance between value and risk. So they talk about cyber and really they're talking about hardening perimeters, you know. They talk about value and and by value they're talking about sharing relating linking data together data is the asset like you said like everything is data everything we do is data that's where the value is but it's also where the risk is and what government hasn't been great at doing so far is is taking risk a step further than just national security and privacy i mean you can find national security data if it's marked, like that's pretty repeatable. You can find privacy information, sensitive personal, it's pretty consistent and patterned. Um, but what they haven't been very good at doing and what no one's been very good at doing is understanding other kinds of regulatory risk. Like um, look at individual health identifier, right? Your, your vaccine certificate, like mm -hmm. on, on MyGov. Yeah. So um, on the FedGov one that you get from MyGov and in quite a few states and territories, on that certificate is your individual health identifier. Your, your personal IHI number. Now, and, and it's public too. Anyone can look at that, you know, if they take a photo of it if they, yep. they do it. Yeah. So if you're emailing a copy of that to your university or your employer or whoever it is, they now have a copy of your IHI. Yeah. There's an act for the IHI. Like there are secrecy provisions around that number because apart from tax file number, like it's that one is the one that exposes you most to fraud and identity yeah. theft. So now we've just had this influx of them because for, for value reasons, for interconnectedness reasons, they've been put on the certificate. It, I'm sure it is adding some value, but it's introduced a massive risk. It's causing spills every single day. Like we had to build a new, um, a, a new tool in Castle Point to just discover IHIs and roll it out to our clients like immediately. We just turned that around a couple of weeks ago because all our university clients and all our government departments, they were getting this influx of IHI numbers, which puts them immediately in a, in a position of potentially having a breach, right? There are civil and criminal penalties for unauthorised use or disclosure of that number. So, you know, if you don't consider the regulatory rules around data and you're just thinking about more data is more value, then you end up with a strategy that's going to lead us away from effective security control. So uh, you also received just recently $3 million in funding. So please tell us about this funding round and how that money is being used. Mm. So that funding was from uh, Main Sequence Ventures, mm -hmm. uh, which is CSIRO's um, venture arm, and that was for hiring. So we've grown from just the two of us uh, founding originally, and now we have nearly 30 wow. uh, here in Canberra and around Australia. Um, and we wanted to recruit the best people. The market obviously is really contested, oh, yeah. so we wanted to make sure that we could, you know, commit to paying those people really, really well. Um, and and as well as hiring, we do a lot of work around culture, so that we have a really strong kind of values-driven environment, which has kept our retention really, really high. So we've been able to, with those funds, um, attract some incredible people, uh, and of course, keep them and look after them going forward. Yeah. And so what is the status of your international expansion? 
Yeah, so we've got really good coverage now across FedGov in Australia, state, local government here in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, a lot of universities, regulated entities, um, and we are working with Austrade now to think about how we take those steps into other markets. We haven't advertised or marketed Castle Point yet. Um, we have, you know, our growth at the moment is like 20% a month in revenue, so the, the organic growth has been very steep without that but we are just refreshing and revising that approach now because once we actually start to market uh, and tell the whole world about this capability and what can be done um, we know the uptake will be really rapid so we're we're dipping those toes very carefully when you need, in those waters you need to scale uh, fast with, when that comes you'll have a lot of customers correct and then yeah. so much demand on your uh, that's right and the quality for us is so important it really needs to be scalable that growth and sustainable so we're just being a little bit cautious about which markets we enter first yeah. um, but the commonwealth is a good sort of target market for us um, similar culture around security and regulation um, obviously similar security profile uh, in terms of information sharing and uh, the same kind of international standards applied for data management and uh, you mentioned New Zealand, but do you already have some customers overseas that have found out about you and said, hey, help us? Yes, we get uh, inquiries from overseas all the time, um, from, you know, the Netherlands to Norway to Uganda. So, <laughs> um, you know, when people do find out about the capability, however they find out about it, usually through something like this, or I'll speak at a webinar or a conference or something, uh, there's word a lot of, of interest. Yeah, yeah, it's word of mouth. That's really Best how way. we've grown. Best way to grow. I think so, because if you have great clients, then they know great people yeah. and they become great clients as well great so awesome. yeah exactly the case studies are really key and awards and um, that kind of recognition has really helped us build that profile well on that front uh, are there any customer success stories you'd like to highlight yeah i mean there's there's heaps um a couple of months ago we got contacted by an australian university on a friday night mm -hmm. late afternoon um, they were having a malicious data breach, they'd been hacked, yep. and they asked if we could help. Um, so we deployed in their network, we ran across all of the data, about 200 separate sites that had been compromised, so that they could index, audit, search and discover what was in there. But we also coded their secrecy provisions under law, so under a bunch of federal and state acts and, and regulations specific to the university sector, there's all sorts of secrecy provisions um, which goes to their exposure. So mm -hmm. We could then calculate out of the data that was spilled, what are you up for in terms of criminal liability? Um, but we also coded their records authorities, like the disposal schedules, mm -hmm. because similar to ANU, that goes to your defensibility. If you've been holding on to risky data that should have been disposed of under law. You could be in trouble. Yeah, so that's important to know as well. So we did all of that and coded it and ran it across all of the data, and that was all done by Saturday afternoon. Wow. So, that's the kind of thing that we get excited about, being able to help organisations recover from things like that and yeah. understand the impacts. But it's even better when we can already be there and prevent those kind of breaches from happening. Like we've already found all that risk data. So it's been hardened, it's been moved, you know, it's been locked down or it's been destroyed so that when that breach happens, the impacts aren't so bad. Now we've seen a lot of digital acceleration due to COVID-19. So how has this affected you and your clients and what lessons did you learn? Yeah, well, I mean, the IHI is a great example. You know, when you have disruptive things happening in the world, um, new risks emerge. Like IHI is not a kind of identifier that has ever been treated by organisations as sensitive. And that's the health one. For that's the, the health identifier. Yeah. Correct. Because if you're not a health provider, you don't even know about the IHI Act. Like for you, it's not been sensitive. So things like that, those curveballs get thrown. Um, but the broader issue is, you know, it goes to the, the general risk, as we mentioned, of having a completely upturned working environment. A lot more cloud systems, a lot more kind of, you know, shadow IT just being adopted um, to meet an immediate need. Uh, less oversight of workers. Um, and what they're doing and of course the devices they're working on it's just very hard to control you know what people are doing with data if you can't have eyes on that digitally the scale of it and the distribution of it makes it impossible to do this manually anymore um, so you know we need tools now we need AI that is watching all the time and will flag and alert if something happens that's a breach of one of those rules, whether it's secrecy, sensitivity, privacy or some other regulatory rule.
So what lessons can you share to other startup founders about creating a company, growing it to almost 30 employees, gaining the trust and business of customers, and getting funding and and, growing internationally? Mm. We um, had a a kind of a mission right from the beginning that we were quite clear on and really clear values. And we just we just formalized them really early. And I think that's really helped a lot because every time we're explaining what we do and why we do it, it comes back to those values. And every time we're making a decision about which way we should go, we're thinking about does it align with our values, you know? And I think if you have kind of a, you know, a guiding light like that or some kind of barometer to test assumptions and ideas and manage risk against, that really helps. And it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be something in particular. It's whatever motivates you as the founder that you know will also motivate people who want to work with you to achieve that mission. If you have that and you can really embed it, then you can you can attract amazing talent. Like Canberra is a very difficult marketplace to attract tech talent, for example, because government and the big, you know, outsourcers scoop it all up. But we have people just reaching out to us to ask to work here because of the values and the culture. So I think that's that's just really, really key. Whatever your mission is, I think you've just like got to weave it into everything that you do and make it a formal part of um, you know your plan and your strategy. Well, it's great to see a bit of success, a startup success story and an inspiration to other companies out there. Yeah, thanks. And, and you know, in Canberra here, it's just driving down the street to your office, it's like a little Silicon Valley right here. There's a lot of little tech companies here. That's right. This is the technology park, <laughs> apparently. So it's good. There is a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of industry here. Um, we're one of the only, I guess, reg techs, and reg tech is a new kind of emerging discipline in yeah. technology. Well, everyone's heard of fintech, but reg tech is yeah. super important. Totally, yeah. yeah. And, you know, a lot of our clients are, are financial and, and, you know, reg tech is considered, I guess, a kind of fintech, but it's, it's broader than that. Mm-hmm. It's understanding regulatory rules, any regulatory rules, so that they can be applied with automation yeah. because there are so many of them and they apply to so much of your data that you really need a way to get on top of it. And I think there's been complacency around that before, mm-hmm. especially with government, because you know the Commonwealth isn't going to prosecute itself, so <laughs> they tend not to really follow the rules. Sure. Um, but government's getting better now at kind of wielding regulation because they've recognised that when breaches happen and when information isn't kept properly, um, is kept too long or too short. It's a national security risk. It is security, and it's also it just goes to like essential human rights, mm. like we've seen. Like Paul McGuire, a young father, he died in the grass tree mine because records weren't kept up to date. Mm. You know, like you can actually have loss of life from not doing this properly. Um, And I think the complacency has come because, you know, as we talked about earlier, there just hasn't been a way to achieve it. Mm. It's just theoretical. Like, yeah, we want to comply, but we can't. So, but now we can. Like with AI, it's, it's possible and we're doing it all over. So I think, you know, the winds are changing a little bit. And to talk about uh, fintech, and also you mentioned awards before. I mean, you've won quite a few awards uh, since 2018. It's pretty impressive. And uh, this includes the recent listing in the Global 100 AI fintech list. So how important are these industry accolades to the business? I think especially in the sort of startup and scale-up stage, really, really important. Mm -hmm. Um, Because we already had a lot of credibility with our FedGov client base from our consulting work. So we already had a bit of a starting point there. Um, But to grow not just a new company, but a brand new paradigm, Mm. you really need as much external validation as you can. And as I mentioned before, we don't market or advertise. We've never done that. So the way that we got that awareness and built that credibility in the marketplace was through those awards. Um, And now that we've been so successful, you know, we've got eight or nine kind of major national and international awards, which is fantastic and a testament to the team. Um, We now are kind of putting the shoe on the other foot and we're supporting those awards and those communities for the next kind of round coming through. You're making sure to extend the ladder, not pull it up behind you. Yeah, it's so important because, you know, the the community gets built not just by the people who are already in it, but by the new people that come in. So, um, you know, awards are a great sort of pipeline into recognition by the broader market. And, you know, if one award helps make a client, you know, make a decision to go with your product, then that award has turned into a case study eventually so I think it's really worth investing in. Now we've spoken about a lot of things to do with Castle Point systems today but what else should we know about that I haven't asked you? 
And I'm sure there's a lot. <laughs> oh, look, there's so much. But I think what um, I like to get across when I talk to people is, again, that, that mission and what we're driven by. So for us, you know, we are trying to change the way the whole world manages their information. Because if we can do that, we can make, you know, communities and we can make organisations, but we can also make individual people safer um, from all different kinds of harm. And we can make those organisations smarter as well. You know, there are ways to get more value out of your data without exposing yourself to more risk. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the kind of things that really motivate us are we're doing some work with the state government at the moment. Uh, they're looking into child sexual abuse in the public service, nurses, teachers, people that got away with things for too long. Mm -hmm. um, so we're running Castle Point across the big databases that go back just decades, generations almost. Um, and we're finding in there little mentions little flags of potential abuse that were maybe not acted on at the time, that were lost in the noise. Um, and now we can make, we can bring them back to the light. We can make them more accountable. The first uh, test set we ran across, um, the database had already been manually searched. It had taken them about a year to create strings and manually. They found about 5,000 results. We found all but two of those uh, in, our, in our pass and of the system system take to scan all of that? Oh, the scanning is really fast. Um, so, I mean, it took humans a year, it took your system yeah, a couple yeah. days or something? Yeah, weeks, weeks, weeks. months to, to scan the amount of data. Yeah. Tuning, working with the organisation to find out which terms are really going to be valuable and useful and how we map the schema, that took a couple of months. Mm -hmm. But having done that, now we've run across the next database, which they hadn't even begun to search and couldn't even really search the binaries in, and we found thousands more. So that's the kind of thing that's achievable with technology like this. If we can make it um, accessible and available, meaning when it's deployed, there's no impacts on users, no impacts on the network, no impacts on the source systems, none of those agents or connectors, and no one has to write hundreds of thousands of rules. Like if you can cover all of the data for the whole life cycle, whether it's on-prem or cloud, structured or unstructured, any format, if you can do that, which we can, and you can apply any and all rules to it, and you can do that with no impacts, then we can actually start to move the needle. Like we can do things that have been infeasible before, and we can make a real difference um, in helping organisations that help people. That's what we want to do, and that's what um, we're excited about. One of the things I love about modern technology is when science fiction turns into science fact. And you have turned, you have taken of something that was just, as you said, theoretical and made it every day. Yeah, and it, it's really run of the mill. Like if yeah. you can if you can do all that in twenty four hours, it's not science fiction anymore. Right. Like it's it's doable and it's done. We do it all the time, and I think that we're seeing so much more uptake of this model because people are seeing it it succeed in these different organisations. And when you've got some great flagship clients like you know the Commonwealth Treasury, for example. Um, that really gives confidence to other organisations that yes, this can be useful, this can be usable, and we should do it. Like we actually do have an imperative to do better, and now we can, so sort of we must. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm just thinking of a crude example, uh, analogy as to um, in, in TV shows about how you know you see the FBI or the or the, or the C, you know CIA and they've taken a photograph of somebody's number plate and it's all fuzzy and they say <laughs> computer enhanced and someone, <laughs> zoom in <laughs> and it's, I know. now it's imperfect <laughs> and actually there is ways of using uh, fractals I think or polygons to be able to fractals to do that to take yeah. something that's low res and, and zoom it to something that's high res so we actually have that ability today yep uh, and uh, it's not quite the same as what you're talking about but it's something similar where technology that's right. was once it was only in movies and TV TV shows announced every day but look to change gears for a moment um, just for a question I always like to ask what's your memory or what's a memory you'd like to share of your first computer right um, so our first computer we probably got that when I was I want to say like 11 10 or 11 maybe mm -hmm. Um, I didn't do much with it except draw pictures in paint and colour them in. I got very, very good at that. Yeah. Uh, and I used to play Jill of the Jungle, love that. Um, and 
word rescue and math rescue, educational games, but they were fun for me. Um, and actually it's sort of come full circle because I've got a five-year-old now among a range of others, um, but he has been learning to read and learning his maths this year, obviously. And I downloaded Word Rescue and Math Rescue oh. for him. And I still, like I can still play it with my eyes closed. It never goes away. So yeah, good memories of those games as a kid and good to see them still there on Steam, yeah. you know, load them up and off he goes. And obviously paint that would have been an early Windows computer. Yes. Yep, that's right. Yep, that's what we had. So how do you see Castle Point systems evolving over the next couple of years? And how do you see the industry evolving into the 2030s? I have visions in mm. my mind of Neuromancer and Johnny Mnemonic and <laughs> accessing data through a headset and virtual reality. Um, it's probably still way too early to be really doing that today, but maybe you've got uh, some people thinking about that already. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the thing that has stopped us doing more like that mm. with data is just not being able to access it all through a single pane of glass. Yeah. Like, I know that's kind of a cliched term, but that's what it is because, you know, like we, um, we did some work with a police agency mapping how we could improve response to uh, domestic abuse. Um, they'd seen rates rise very steeply in the early parts of the pandemic. And the challenge was that in order to try to understand the, the factors that help determine whether an abuser is a really high risk and the patterns of behaviour that help determine how you should respond to a call out, you have to search six or eight separate databases. So you have to log into one, run all your searches, somehow kind of map that data, then log into another one and you're trying to link data across these silos, Manual. as you mentioned. Yeah. And there's no time to do that. Yeah. Um, you'd, you'd rather be on the beat, like yeah. literally you'd rather just get in the car and go. So um, so police were, were just looking maybe at the crimes, maybe at the intelligence, but not at anything else. And that's not enough of a picture. So what we can do now that we actually can, with an agentless model, we can register every single system in a network on-prem and in the cloud and register every record in the system, structured or unstructured, and every item in every record. And then we use natural language processing to get all the meaningful key phrases and named entities. Like we read every word in every item, email, database, PDF, old Lotus Notes files that you can't even open, whatever. Once we can capture all that and put it in the Castle Point database, and for, like for Treasury, I think the Castle Point database is maybe nearly three billion rows now. So once you can put all that in one place, you can run your searches across it and your audits, and you can run those regulatory rules. And we create ontologies like a risk ontology or value ontologies. You can run it across everything at once. And that's the bit that hasn't been possible. There's been no way to interrogate it all at the same time without pulling it all into a data lake at a point in time or putting in some kind of integrator or connector, which is very limited as well. So, you know, we hope that people can take what we do, which we designed for information control, and find more ways to, to use it, like to, to activate it in solving other problems because we can finally have eyes on all that data dynamically so we can see like the moment something changes or something happens that would be you know a breach or a spill and we can act on it and um, we're seeing our clients start to experiment with that and do some cool stuff. And when a new customer comes to you potentially with exabytes or even petabytes of data how long does it take to ingest all of that and then how often is new data put into the system is it in real time is it ingested once a day, what's the short version around that? Yeah, um, it depends on how many servers they want to spin up. Mm -hmm. So Castle Point, we, the base is three virtual machines. Um, and on that, it processes around, I guess the benchmark's about 10,000 items an hour. If they're big PDFs that we need to OCR, it takes longer. If they're emails, it's faster, but that's kind of the benchmark. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got a client at the moment that, um, a, a FedGov client who want to decommission their traditional EDRMS um, and they need that done by January so they don't need to renew. Um, so for them I think they've spec'd up to 12 or 18 servers or something. So if you need more uh, speed, you just have more servers and the job's done faster? Yeah, and then when it's done, um, we just decommission those extra servers and then once we've done that full big back capture of the data, we're just indexing deltas. So that can be uh, time-based, daily, or it can be event-based. You know, if we see a change, we go and index. It doesn't really matter. So it can be real-time or on whatever schedule you want. Yeah. yeah. That's very flexible. Yeah. Well, you have to be, um, especially when you're supporting government, mm. you have to support on-prem and cloud. 
both. And hybrid. <laughs> and hybrid. Um, you have to make sure that as well as no impacts on your general users and on your regulatory team and your data, and you also can't have impacts on the network performance. So, you know, Castle Point runs 24-7, 365 in these agencies and it just doesn't make a flicker on the, on the network because it has to be, like, you need to achieve the full coverage, but you just can't, there is no tolerance for detrimental impacts. There's none. So that's what's unique, I guess, about how we architected it is we started from that base. I said to Gav, it needs to do all of these requirements. There are thousands of requirements. It has to do all the systems, all the data, all the rules, all the time for the whole life cycle, and it can't have any impacts. Make it go. And that's what he built, and that's what we've been operating. Pretty amazing. So what is the best piece of advice that you've ever received to help you get where you are today? I've received so much good advice, and I think what I've taken away from all of it is that you don't have to change, I guess, as a person or as a, a leader, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, you know, you get a lot of um, bad advice sometimes. You know, people telling you, like, don't say sorry so much, don't use exclamation points, like, communicate more like a man. And then you get advice like, no, like, embrace your femininity and lean into being a woman in yeah. IT or whatever. Yeah. But actually what you need to do is just be who you are and lead the way that you want to lead. Mm -hmm. And the, you just have to understand that if you respect other people and you care about other people, then you're okay, you know. And you also shouldn't spend time arguing with people and trying to explain to them why they should care about other people. If they don't understand that, there's no point even talking about it. And once you just have that very basic understanding that you need to care about all of your staff, all of your clients, all of your stakeholders, your whole supply chain, um, then you can kind of just go forth and do that. And I think that's what I've learned from the more inspiring leaders is that they just have that, you know, that principle and then they don't try to change their behavior with any kind of gimmicks or anything. You just need to just be you and just follow that essential line. So, what is your final message to ITY viewers and readers and to your current and future customers and partners? I think the important thing to know is that this is your responsibility. You have a responsibility. If you have information that is sensitive, that exposes individuals or other companies or your own organisation to risk, you have to manage it. And I know you haven't been able to very well. It's been very hard to manage information properly because of technical limitations, but it is possible now. And you kind of, you need to do it. You need to take those steps to understand what your risk is and start to actively manage it. You can't prevent all the bad things from happening, but you can definitely reduce the impact if they do. And those are the kind of things that we should be thinking about every day. Well, Rachel Greaves, co-founder and CEO of Castle Point Systems, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for yourself and Gavin to invent this kind of system that uh, is changing people's and co companies' lives. And uh, I hope we can speak again in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.